Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, our next presenter uh, will be uh, Frank Hawkins. Uh, Frank is a historian on the battles of World War II, and especially of the Iwo Jima battle on the first Japanese soil of the United States Marines. Um, Frank uh, uh, has been a captain in the Army and served as a case officer in clandestine uh, operations in the Defense Intelligence Agency. He's an author, and I think you'll enjoy his uh, presentation. Frank? Well, first of all, let me say, um, it's a tough act to follow Emmett. Uh, I just, you just can't believe how much he's got stored up in that brain of his. He knows an awful lot, and it's very impressive, uh, a very impressive uh, um, presentation by him. I, uh, in fact, I learned a lot about World War One that I had not known. So, uh, thanks so much. Thank Problem like that. So, uh, and by the way, all of us in this room um, need to thank Emmett for the amazing job uh, that he has done um, in building the museum here in Dubai. It's a really special place, and um, it's a great credit to this community. And I know there's some of you here uh, who have worked with him in the museum. And uh, so, Emmett, you need to take a bow again for thanks for all that you've done for this community. You know, as the years slip by, Americans have become increasingly distant from what happened in World War II. And I, I fear that the carnage and the unimaginable sacrifices of that era are now totally beyond the comprehension of a generation that has trouble identifying even one country on the world map. And that's why I so greatly appreciate the work that Emmett and his friends have done to put this fabulous museum together in this town. Iwo Jima was one of the most voracious battles in a world war that was filled with voracious battles. The small island was a critical stepping stone to ending the war. The battle created this historic image. And it ultimately defined the United States Marine Corps. Today, I'm going to cover the actions that led up to the battle, its role in the outcome of the war, some information about the atomic bombs, which were dropped on Japan, and finally, the battle itself, along with some personal observations uh, based on my own visit to Iwo Jima. Since the Japanese gained control of the island, back in 1968. They only, they open the island now only one time a year for American veterans who can attend a joint Japanese-American uh, memorial service. And that means that only one plane load of veterans a year is able to visit the island, which today is a Japanese military base with no permanent inhabitants. Uh, two years ago, I was privileged to attend the 71st reunion of honor on Iwo Jima. And getting to the Iwo had always been at the very top of my bucket list. My previous number one had been to take my two grandsons to Normandy, to the D-Day beaches, and something I did in 2011. The one-day visit to Iwo Jima was the highlight of a two-week tour uh, it took me to Pearl Harbor, and Saipan, Pinion, and Guam and the Marianas. And these are all, of course, critical battle sites in the Pacific in World War II. World War II, the United States officially began the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. You all know this, December 7th, 1941. Franklin Roosevelt declared it a day uh, that would live in infamy. The attack 
was a tactical uh, victory for the Japanese. As it turned out, it was a strategic catastrophe. It ended with the massive destruction of their country, its people, and the total destruction of their war machine. On Hickam Field on Fort Island, where you can still see today bullet and shell marks from the attack, there were 189 Americans who were killed on, on, on Fort Island, 303 wounded, and 79 planes damaged or destroyed. But all in on Pearl Harbor, with 2,869 American dead, the nation which had been very much isolationist, particularly after World War I, was suddenly aroused out of its mindset. Three battleships, the Utah, the Oklahoma, and the Arizona were destroyed, along with a number of smaller craft. But significantly, there was no damage to the aircraft carriers, which were out at sea at that, on that day. And there was no damage to the oil tanks, and no damage to the repair facilities. This was a major strategic error by the Japanese because this enabled the Americans to more rapidly gear up and engage them. And by the way, you know, we heard earlier from Emmett about the small size of the American army when World War I broke out. Well, when World War II broke out, America had the 34th largest army in the world, just behind Uruguay. <laughs> So relative to the armed forces of either Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, let alone both, uh, the US military uh, size and power is pretty small. Now this is the gun turret of the uh, USS Arizona, which you see today if you go to Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Arizona Memorial, which is truly hallowed ground, is the final resting place for many of the ship's 1177 uh, crewmen who died that day. Now, this is interesting. This is the Asia Pacific map in July of 1942, just some months after December of 41. And here you can see the full extent of the Japanese expansion. The Japanese at that point occupied major portions of Manchuria and China, as well as Korea, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, which was then known as the French Indochina, Indonesia, which was then known as the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines, parts of New Guinea, the Gilbert Islands, the Solomon Islands, the Marshall Islands, the Marianas, and the very tip of Alaska. What the map doesn't show is that the Japanese expansion had stalled only a month earlier in the Battle of Midway, when four of the six Japanese major fleet carriers were sunk. That already was the turning point, as it turned out, in the Pacific War. But it would go on for more than three more years. And you know, it's interesting to note that at that time, the Japanese were building one new carrier. By comparison, the United States was already building 17 new carriers. So one could already perceive, even at that early date, what the outcome of the war was going to be. It was only going to be a matter of time, expense, and of course, and sadly, a good deal of bloodshed on both sides. Now this shows you the geographical uh, position of the Marianas. These are the stepping stones to Japan. You can see Saipan, and uh, Guam and Tanian, which are three islands I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And you can see they go right up, and you can see that's, that's mainland Japan at the very top. Um, and by the way, this map is on the floor of the Aviation Museum at Hickam Field. And it's a good way to understand, however, the relative position of the Marianas and why they were so critical to the ultimate victory in the Pacific. Now, the initial landing in the Marianas didn't happen until June 15th, 1944. That was two years after the Battle of Midway, when the Marines landed on Saipan. 25 days of fighting, where 3,400 Americans killed, 
13,000 wounded, 29,000 Japanese dead, only 2,100 Japanese defenders survived. A month later, the Marines landed on Guam, July 21st, 44, 21 days of fighting, 1,400 U.S. personnel killed or missing, 6,000 wounded. Japanese dead were approximately 11,000. 68 Japanese didn't surrender until September 4th, 1945. And one corporal, Yoiki Suichi of the 38th Infantry, he finally sur uh, surrendered in January of 1973, 28 years later. Now, I, I tend to get emotional every time I see this picture because it really captures the human side of the war. It's a heartbreaker. Finally discovered and brought to safety by the Marines, this young mother is cowering in a cave with her children in a cave entrance. You see, the Japanese, knowing that the Americans were coming, the Japanese had convinced the local Japanese civilian population and the Chamorros that the invading Marines would rape their women and barbecue their children. The result was the suicide cliffs on Saipan and Tinian. It's estimated that about 8,000 uh, Japanese soldiers as well as uh, civilian men, women, and children committed suicide by jumping off of these cliffs. July 24, 1944, the Marines landed on Tinian, one of the smallest, but as it turned out, perhaps the most important island of the Marianas. Uh, uh, hang on a minute. Just it's, only, it's only three miles south of Saipan. And of 8,500 Japanese defenders, only 300 survived during nine days of bloody fighting. The capture of Tinian, however, quickly changed the nature of the war because it became the busiest airport in the world. It became the takeoff point for bombing flights to Japan. And of course, this included the B-29 Super Fortresses, the Enola Gay and Boxcar, the two planes that carried the atomic bombs to Japan. The Tinian is a relatively small, 39 square miles in size. But it's perfectly flat and ideal for air facilities within striking distance of Japan. Now, this is runway able. This is exactly the runway where the Enola Gay and the boxcar lifted off for Japan. And if you see that little marker sort of in the back of the picture, that's exactly the point where the planes would become airworthy and get right up. There's a hedge sort of behind here, and they got right up over that sort of hedge row. It's quite interesting. Now, um, uh, this is the landing, the lo excuse me, this is the loading pit where the atomic bombs were actually loaded onto the planes. The little boy bomb was 12 feet long, weighed 9,000 pounds, and it was the uranium bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Now, the loading process was quite interesting. You see, it's a very heavy bomb, and they had to figure out a way to get it up into the bomb bay of the aircraft. So what they did is they dug these pits, you saw the pit, and they lowered the bomb down into the pit. And then what they had to do was, in the back of the aircraft, that's the Enola Gay in that photo, in the back of the Enola Gay, back over the pit, and then using a hydraulic lift that was already installed on the pit, they pushed the bomb up into the bomb bay. Now this is the fat man, the plutonium bomb, which is dropped on Nagasaki uh, three days later. But not without a good deal of unwanted drama. You see, the, the run of Hiroshima went perfectly. Everything that they had planned to do went, the weather cooperated, everything was just perfect. But it didn't work out that way for the second run. You see, the primary target that day was a town called Kokura, and the boxcar was, was piloted by Major Charles Sweeney. 
And during the pre-flight inspection, the flight engineer told Sweeney, we have a problem. We have a broken fuel pump, transfer pump, it would make it impossible to transfer the 640 gallons of fuel that's in the reserve tank back into the plane. Now this, and this fuel would have to be carried all the way to Japan and back if they didn't swap it out somehow, which of course would mean more fuel that the plane would require. Replacing the pump would take hours. Moving the fat man to another aircraft might take just as long, but it was dangerous as well because at that point the bomb was now alive. So Group Commander Tibbets, who had been the pilot of the Enola Gay and, and his boss and Sweeney made the decision to go ahead with the mission. But the weather was not cooperating. The initial target, Kokura, was totally covered with clouds and they were under very strict orders not to drop the bomb until they could actually see the target. And so it was totally fogged in and clouded over. So Sweeney had to divert to the secondary target, Nagasaki, where a small opening in the clouds finally permitted them to identify the target, and they destroyed 44% of the city of Nagasaki. Uh, the bomb was dropped over. Yeah, the bomb was dropped over the city's industrial valley midway between the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Work in the south and the Mitsubishi Urokami Ordnance Works in the north. Estimated 35,000 people killed and 60,000 injured. Uh, of those killed, about 27,000 were Japanese munitions workers, 2,000 were Korean slave laborers, 150 were Japanese soldiers. Now, the rest of the drama came to head, to head back after the bombing uh, run, and the plane was low on fuel. They were not going to be able to make it back to Tinian. And where do you think they landed? Iwo Jima. And the story is that literally, as the plane touched down onto that runway, they had run out of fuel on two of the engines. And those engines stopped working literally as they hit the, as they hit the tarmac. So and that's a hell of a story, and uh, one a lot of Americans don't know about today. Um, uh, with 129,000 immediately killed in the two cities, and by the way, a total of 275,000 ultimately died uh, due to injuries and radiation poisoning. But the two bombs effectively ended the war, ultimately saving over a million lives, both American and Japanese. Prior to the bomb, the American planners had been forecasting very heavy casualties on both sides in the event of an invasion. And at the time, they were prepared, the Americans were prepared to burn out and flatten every city in Japan. The Allied bombing campaign had been led by General Curtis LeMay. And he, uh, and his bombing efforts, which had burned out a number of cities, including a large section of Tokyo, were one of the main factors along with the atomic bombs that influenced the Japanese government to surrender. The most commonly cited estimate of Japanese casualties from all of the raids from Curtis LeMay was 333,000 killed and 473,000 wounded. And there are other estimates that go much higher, but it was quite clear that Japan was facing total annihilation. The ferocity of the battle for Iwo Jima and Okinawa had demonstrated the prevailing death before dishonor mentality. There is one interesting footnote. Anticipating casualties from an invasion of Japan, the planners had manufactured so many Purple Hearts medals that even to this day, Purple Heart awards are still coming from that batch. It's little known that there was a third bomb ready to go. It was scheduled for Tokyo on August the uh, 18th, if the Japanese had not surrendered by then. The plan was to drop the bomb into a burned out section of Tokyo where the mushroom cloud could be seen from the palace. Uh, it turned out there was enough material and parts on Tinian at that point for 50 plutonium bombs. And that brings us back six months earlier 
to the hell that was Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima was the next to last stepping stone to mainland Japan, Okinawa being the last, of course. As it turned out, Iwo Jima was considered by the Japanese spiritually and politically uh, to be part of the mainland. They were determined to defend it literally to the death. And for the Americans, Iwo Jima was important for two reasons. One, they needed to silence an important radar warning station that could alert on the mainland that the bombers were coming. But the other thing was that they needed the landing site for the bombers coming back from Japan, such as we saw with the boxcar. It's only a tiny island. It's eight miles square, just a bit longer than downtown Brevard. The invasion took place on February 19, 1945. Uh, the Marines initially said, well, we should, we should be able to wrap this up in about a week. But the island wasn't declared secure until 36 days of ferocious warfare. The battle was horrific. There were 22,000 Japanese defenders. Only 216 survived. Four Marine divisions went ashore. That's about 110,000 troops. 7,000 Marines were killed. That's basically the population of Brevard. Another 20,000 wounded. Total casualties killed and wounded on the American side were higher for the Marines than the Japanese. It was the only battle during the war when total U.S. Marine casualties exceeded Japanese casualties. And by the way, there's a very interesting footnote to this. The last two Japanese soldiers who hid out in the extensive cave system did not surrender until January the 6th, 1949. That's almost four years later. Now, this map shows... Oops, sorry, we missed one. Keep going. Yeah, this map shows the location of Mount Suribachi and the eastern and western uh, landing beaches. So what made this thing so deadly? Well, there were 11 miles of interconnected pillboxes, bunkers, supply depots, and even a large hospital, all completely concealed underground. And one other factor, an overriding order from the Japanese commander, General Tadamichi Kuribashi, kill 10 Americans before you die. Kuribayashi was a part-time writer, a haiku poet, a diplomat, and general of the Imperial Japanese Army, general staff. He insisted on sharing the hardships with his men. He refused to permit bonsai charges, which he regarded as an unnecessary waste of his men's lives. Although the United States Marine Corps expected to capture Iwo Jima in just five days, as I said earlier, he and his men held out for 36 days. It's believed that he was killed in action in the final assault, but his body was never identified by the United States military. Interestingly, he knew a lot about America. He had been the deputy military attache in Washington in 1928. 13 years before Pearl Harbor. For two years, he traveled across the United States conducting extensive military and industrial research. And for a short time, he even studied at Harvard. After returning to Tokyo, he was promoted to major and appointed the first military attache to Canada. In 1940, he was promoted to major general. And during the lead up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, he is reported to have told his family America is the last country in the world Japan should fight. He knew what would happen, one way or the other. Now, his defenses on the island included over 730 blockhouses, pillboxes, light and heavy artillery, uh, anti-aircraft weapons, and so on. There were 201 major installations on the eastern beach alone. Underground defenses included thousands of yards of tunnels, including 7,000 yards within Suribachi itself. Here's a, uh, here's a cross-section map that projects how the tunnels inside Mount Suribachi uh, might have looked. Now this blockhouse map is really intriguing. Someone went through and did a location of every known Japanese firing positions. So you're not looking at a, a measles case on Iwo Jima. 
you're seeing all those all those firing positions, and now you can see why the Marines literally had to battle for every bloody inch of that island. And here's a color shot that was taken on the beach, two Marines dead. Uh, here's an aerial shot of the beach on the afternoon of the landing. You can see the equipment uh, uh, broken up and, and so on. Here are two Marines uh, making their way up Mount Suribachi to plant the American flag. There were actually uh, two flags. Uh, the flag in the famous photograph shot by uh, AP photographer Joe Rosenthal was actually the second flag raised. Now this shot was apparently taken as the two flags were being swapped. And here's a shot taken just after the raising of the flag with the Marines celebrating. Here's one of the uh, Japanese bunkers that you would see it today. And there's a rusted out uh, Japanese uh, machine gun in that bunker. The search for remains still goes on. Here's a shot taken in association with the recovery of 1,200 Japanese remains. There are still, think about this, there were 22,000 Japanese on the island. There are still 13,000 Japanese MIAs. And there's still 494 American MIAs on Iwo Jima. Because of this, the island is considered hallowed ground by both the Americans and the Japanese. Only one day a year, as I said earlier, Americans are allowed to visit uh, for the uh, reunion of honor. And this, this, was a, this uh, reunion of honor was established in 2002. And what's most interesting is that since then, more people have reached the top of Mount Everest than have reached the top of Mount Suribachi. Now, if you will permit me a few personal observations uh, from my uh, trip to uh, Iwo Jima. Uh, there were six veterans of the battle with us on that trip two years ago. They were old men then, and I'm not sure how many of them are still alive. Here's our arrival at Iwo following the flight in from Guam. We were greeted, and you can't quite see it in this photo, but you almost can. You see the guy going down the, the, the gangplank there, the gateway, uh, down the steps there, and at the base of the steps is standing uh, a three-star Marine general, Lieutenant General Nicholson. He's the commander, he was then the commander of the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force based on Okinawa. And they had flown in a little bit earlier to greet all of us who'd come in on the honor flight uh, from Guam. And he, he and the, behind him is a two-star, and there's a one, couple of, maybe one or two one-stars, and then a bunch of other lesser ranks officers that greeted every single person who came off the honor flight. It was quite impressive, I have to say. And the, and the, and the Iwo Jima vets were greeted with total reverence and awe by the young Marines. It was quite an amazing, amazing and emotional moment. This is Mount Suribachi. I got to the top. I'm very proud of the fact that I walked up the whole thing. You know, being an old man, it wasn't easy, but I made it. And I'm holding here in the lower left-hand corner, I'm holding a picture of Fred Moss. Fred Moss was a tank driver of the 5th Marine Division who survived the battle. That's in this picture on the upper right uh, corner here. He's the guy standing on the far left holding a Japanese flag. Turns out that Fred Moss happens to be the grandfather of my son-in-law. So here are the, the sands of Iwo Jima. And it's interesting, of course, this is the way it looks today with me standing there, the, the uh, tourist at the back. And that's the way it looked in the battle. I mean, to me, it was quite an emotional moment just to be there, knowing what had happened there a few years earlier. Uh, there were 27 medals of honor awarded the Marines and the Navy Corpsmen. That was roughly a third of all the Medals of Honor in the Pacific to Marines. Admiral Nimitz said, among the Americans who served on Iwo Jima, uncommon valor was a common virtue. This is Jerry Yellen. He was a P-51 fighter pilot in World War II. He flew the last combat mission of the war. And one of the men on that flight with him 
was the last guy killed in action in the war. But Jerry Yellen's story is fascinating. He hated the Japanese. When the war ended, he went back to America, got married, had a business, raised a family, and his son grew up. And his son somehow ended up moving to Japan. And his son ended up marrying a Japanese woman. So in this picture, what you see is now, all these years later, at 92 years old, you see Jerry Yellens sitting there next to his Japanese-American granddaughter. That's her. And she and he both took part in the wreath-laying ceremony. Uh, by the way, he died in December 2017, and he's buried in the Arlington uh, National Cemetery. Uh, this is a uh, photo of the island that I took as I flew back to Guam. Now, this presentation would not be complete without this photo. This is General MacArthur signing documents of surrender on September 2nd, uh, 1945. Actually, uh, it was my fifth birthday, as well as being six months after the capture of Iwo Jima. It was the end of a world war with some 60 million dead. That's 3% of the world's population at the time. Now behind him you'll see, in the far left there, you can barely see, uh, are General Wainwright and British General Percival, who were both POWs during the war. Percival had been the commander in Singapore, and Wainwright had been in Corregidor, had been the commander in Corregidor. Now also see number three, who's the, the admiral on that long list, he's sort of almost to the left, number three, that's Vice Admiral Slew McCain. He is the grandfather of Senator John McCain. Now, there's one other man of interest here to me. I think it's number 10. And that is General Courtney Hodges. And the reason I find that so interesting is, that as far as I can tell from all the readings that I've done is, that Hodges is the only person known to have participated in both the surrender of Japan and the surrender ceremonies in Germany in early May of 1945. Now, some years ago, I gave my grandsons a coffee table book called Battle. It's a remarkable visual journey through 5,000 years of combat. It traces the history of warfare from the first recorded battle in Megadu in 1800 BC between the Hittites and the Egyptians in Mesopotamia, an area now known as Iraq. And, and it goes all the way through the Iraq War, the book does. As you go through the pages, you see empires and countries and civilizations come and go. None survive for very long. Very few, very few survived more than several hundred years. And in some respects, that's quite frightening when you think that America is already 243 years old. Now, the book makes it clear that the war, that war is the real history of humankind. Civilizations, empires, entire cultures are destroyed and created. War affects and influences politics, economics, Technology, medicine, literature, the arts, language, film, music, virtually every aspect of life. Wars about courage and leadership and organization, skill and ingenuity. It brings out the very worst and the very best in humankind. I have one other observation which is likely to be somewhat unpopular, but I'll make it anyhow. I believe that war is part of the human DNA. If you show weakness, you cannot avoid it. Weakness is indeed provocative. The only hope of preventing war is to be so strong that no one would dare challenge you. And, but of course, when you're dealing with an ideology that essentially worships death, then of course it's a more complicated situation. I put this inscription in the book for my grandsons, one of whom graduated from West Point in 2017 and is now on duty as a lieutenant in the 60th 
uh, Air Missile Defense Brigade at Fort Hood, Texas. If you don't know history, you know very little. You're merely a leaf that doesn't know it's part of a tree and the tree is part of a forest. Think of history as a fast early warning system, a gallery of pictures in which there are very few originals and many copies. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Yes, I was wondering with your considerable experience and knowledge, your reaction if you care to comment on the debacle involving John Bradley and the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. Well, it was sad. I, I mean, I, I mean, he, his son, who wrote the book, as you know, uh, his son clearly believed that he was the guy. And uh, these uh, researchers came along all these years later, and by uh, examining the pants, uh, the bottom of the pants, and one thing, another, on the uniforms, they discovered, they determined that Bradley was not one of them. So, you know, the Bradley story is still accurate. He was there. Maybe he didn't plant that flag, but all the other stuff in that book is accurate. So, as I say, it's sort of sad that you get that little twist. You sort of hope it had been Bradley, but if it wasn't, so be it. Yes, sir? Was there any uh, the feeling when they should be? How was the feeling between the Japanese and the Americans? Was there any tension or ill will? Well, I mean, what you see is the people who are involved in those ceremonies, at least outwardly and publicly, are totally devoted to mutual respect and basically, let's not ever let this happen between us again. That's the mindset. And so the ceremony went on for, I don't know, 45 minutes. And the Japanese were all there. They laid wreaths and they bowed and so on. And the Americans all got up. There were a bunch of Americans, not just Yellen and his uh, granddaughter, but a bunch of other Americans, uh, uh, service people, one kind or another. And they all, retired generals, that sort of thing. And they all got up and they, they put wreaths down too. So. Frank, that picture you showed with the uh, signing of the surrender? Yeah. July of this year, we had a senior citizen group come in, and he's looking, this one old gentleman was looking at the picture, and he goes, that's me right here. Wow. So we had one of those people, at that surrender in the museum here. We that's right. heavy duty. And so we brought him back in, and he actually did some living history with him. Well, that's heavy duty. Yeah. Uh, that another great good. program by the museum, by the way. Yeah. You guys have done a great job. Yes, sir. Do you know anything about the Purple Code before World War II, before Pearl Harbor, and supposedly President Roosevelt had knowledge that we were going to be bombed? You know, there's been a lot of controversy, a lot of stuff written about it. Uh, you know, issues about the Japanese code having been uh, broken and so on. Um, I, 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 I'm out. I don't have a specific thought about it. In, the men, in other words, I've read both sides of that story. Um, I, I choose to believe that Roosevelt didn't, but certainly anybody looking back and reading all the tea leaves and seeing all the pieces of the puzzle could have said, Christ, the bastards are on their way. But uh, whether, he, whether Roosevelt specifically knew about it, uh, it's a tough call. I'm not sure. I, I doubt it, but it's possible, I guess. But I, 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 by and large, I doubt it. Yes, sir? Just a curiosity about war bonds. Mm -hmm. Last war bond effort, I think, in World War II, where they raised you know, a tremendous amount of money. That effort used the Iwo Jima image from Joe Rosenthal of the raising of that flag on Mount Suribachi as, as the, one of the keys for that whole bond initiative. And it was one of the most successful, I think, during the whole World War II uh, cycle. But the people that they had touring around the country that were supposedly in that image, maybe only one of them really was. You no, know, I, I think they all were. There were, there were three of them yeah. touring around, I believe. And so there's an issue about whether Bradley really was, and it raises some oh, some really interesting questions about Bradley himself. Hold on, I'll get to you. Uh, but if you remember, uh, in the book, Bradley's book, that whole issue was discussed to some amount and how it led to alcoholism from the Indian and the uh, guy with the French name. They, they all end up with personal problems. Uh, so that all that was, was very sad, I have to say. But when Clint Eastwood made the movie, 
The movie stressed the Bond thing. That was very disappointing to me, that how he angled the movie. The whole, the whole movie that he did on that, which I name I can't recall right Flags now. Flags of Our Fathers? Yeah, Flags of Our Fathers. And, and, the, and that movie was basically angled and projected onto the war bond effort and how hard it was on these men to go back because they didn't feel that they were the heroes. The heroes were the guys that got killed. Yes, sir. Well, I guess there was isolationism in America at the time. But then our government support uh, men lease. We were giving equipment and firepower to other to the uh, Russians and British. Okay, so it's a long topic and too much to get into now. But I'll make a couple of comments about it. Uh, first of all, there was a very strong isolationist uh, segment here. I mean, you had you had very prominent Americans, including Henry Ford, who was against uh, who sort of who sort of admired Hitler and admired the, uh, the Nazis and the Germans, and you had uh, uh, Lindbergh, who was openly against the war and was openly sort of in favor of the Germans. So you have all of that going on. But what happened was, as the British began to be under assault uh, from basically uh, August of 1939 all the way through 1940, remember the Americans didn't get in the war until late to the end of 41. So all during the period of 1940 and most of 41, the British were hanging out there more or less all by themselves. Because remember, Hitler had signed a non-aggression pact with Stalin. So the Russians, at least for that moment, were neutralized. So Hitler could totally focus on, on France and Belgium and the Low Countries and, 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 Europe, and Europe as a whole. And so Britain was all by itself. And uh, they were sinking fast. They didn't have the resources to hold up against the Germans. And so ultimately, Churchill uh, was able to convince Roosevelt to help him, and that's what led to the lease. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's more or less the way it ran. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I like what you answered about the Japanese respect, the, the question that Bruce um, asked, and I'd like to add to that, that I've been to the West Point Museum, my husband and I, in, at West Point many, many times. And each time, every single time, there are more Japanese people there than American. They may be Japanese American, but they're of Japanese descent. They are so respectful. They walk, they read, they, they get tears in their eyes, and it's just really moving. Yeah, you know, I've been to Japan. I've been to Japan a number of times, and um, <laughs> Japanese people are remarkable. I could talk for an hour just about Japan itself, and I, I won't because I can see I'm about to be tossed out of here. But. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I will say, they, uh, it is a remarkable transformation of Japanese society from what was going on in the 40s, where they literally were beheading people for sport uh, to, and eating livers from a downed American uh, airman uh, to the, the uh, society that they had become today. It's quite remarkable. So anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, and uh, to keep, to stay with us. Oh, I saw on TV, yeah. I guess that's where I saw it, yeah. Oh, no, she had another one. Oh, that's right. Oh, you said she had so many followers.